All right, and thanks uh, very much to Mark for sorting me out. Um, so my name's Ed Green, I'm from the University of Adelaide, um, and so I'm gonna be talking about multi-phase modeling of uh, cell-induced gel contraction. Um, when it says multi-phase, this is uh, kind of in the mixture theory sort of um, way of thinking about that word. Um, so my talk is quite similar to what John King was talking <laughs> about a couple of days ago. Um, so a little bit different from what we've seen so far. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today is joint work with uh, PhD student James Riop and Yvonne Stokes, who's a professor at Adelaide. But I also wanted to highlight um, some other members of the group who are here, um, in particular uh, Daniel Netherwood, who I think many people at UEA will know, who's a postdoc in our group, um, and Alex Tam, my colleague at um, the other university in Adelaide, which we're shortly to merge with. Um, so Alex has a poster uh, on display later, um, which I'd all encourage you to come and look at. Um, and finally, a member of the group who's not here, but is another kind of local boy made good, um, is Ben Binder. Um, so we all work together on some quite similar problems. Um, so I just wanted to sort of acknowledge um, all of my collaborators. All right. So the sort of the, the basic sort of thing that I'm talking about in terms of the biological problem today is really um, cells and their sort of ex, um, interactions with the extracellular matrix. So the extracellular matrix, or ECM, is um, a sort of scaffolding which uh, in vivo is um, sort of supporting the cells and is sort of providing them some sort of framework um, to live in. So. Uh, in your body, this can be um, pretty complicated kind of material. So some of the things that are um, frequently present include um, proteins like collagen and fibrin, um, proteoglycans and various other things. So this is a very complicated material. Um, but if you want to try and grow cells or tissue in, in vitro, um, one way to, to help the cells kind of function correctly and form into the correct kind of structures is to try and mimic this correct extracellular matrix that they would have um, in vivo. So one of the things that people do in order to try and mimic this stuff is um, essentially to seed the cells within gels. So collagen gel um, is a popular one, but there are various other kinds of gel, some of them um, synthetic with all sorts of different properties um, that you can use. And, in fact, changing the composition of your extracellular matrix can have quite a pronounced effect on what your cells do. So this is a picture I stole from um, a, a, another project from a few years ago, from a study group project, this one from uh, I think Anna Soto's group. So these cells were memory epithelial cells, and depending on, on the amount of matrogel um, that you put in the, the gel that they're living in, um, you either get these sort of acyanai, where they're little, like, rounded blobs, or you get these more sort of elongated uh, duct shapes. So the extracellular matrix is kind of fairly important biologically. All right, so to do something a bit simpler, um, this is the problem that I'm going to look at in this talk. And so this picture is from quite an old now set of experiments, but it sort of sums up what's happening and people um, still kind of do similar things to this. So essentially, um, what you can do is you can put your cells in a gel, whatever kind of gel that you like, and then your gel is gonna sit in a bath of um, liquid nutrient, which is supplying them with um, whatever your particular cells like to have. So in the picture that we've got here, the gel is spherical, and you can see it starts off sort of quite big like this, and then over the course of a few days, well, the forces generated by the cells will cause the um, sphere to contract. You can influence this in various ways with chemical factors and so forth. Um, but the degree of contraction over time gives you um, some idea of how, um, I guess, much how much force your cells can generate. So in this case, um, the gel 
is a uh, sphere, um, but more frequently people use things like thin disks because they're easier um, just to kind of pour into a little tray and set and you get a thin disk. So one of the things, uh, so, so there's been modeling of this kind of problem going back to this Moon and Tranquilo paper, um, but one of the things that previous models don't really take into account is that there could be movement of fluid in and out of this gel as it's contracting. <coughs> so that's what we were trying to look at. All right, so this is our little um, simple picture of what is meant to be a thin layer of gel. So it's not a disc, it's just a flat layer because that makes things a little bit easier. And so it's got a length, L, which can change in time. It's got this height, um, H, and we're going to assume that um, for the sake of um, our modeling, we're fixing the center at the origin, and that everything is symmetric. So it's symmetric um, about both axes. So really, we only need to look at this quarter to figure out what's going on. And the other thing that I need to tell you is that so in the inside of the gel, inside the blue bit here, we're going to assume that there's a combination of network or polymer and um, solution, essentially something like water. And then outside of the gel here, we've just got the solution, the water. So everywhere, we're going to have um, a no voids condition. So theta P and theta S here are going to be our volume fractions of um, polymer and solution. So they're everywhere going to add up to one. But essentially, out here, outside of the gel, it's just going to be theta S is one all the time. Now, inside of the gel as well, I have to put cells, having gone on about them for so long, it would be a bit strange if I didn't. Um, and they're going to have a density n, but um, I'm going to assume that uh, the volume fraction that they um, occupy is negligible. So that um, is generally a good assumption at the start of experiments, where when we've worked it out, we think the volume fraction um, might be as low as 1%. Um, obviously, if this gel gets very compacted and the cells get a lot denser, um, we might start to worry about that. Um, but for the sake of this model, we're, we're not going to have an extra phase um, for cells. All right, so that's a uh, basic setup of what's going on. And so here are our model's basic equations. So we've already had the no voids condition. Um, we're going to have conservation of our two phases, and we're going to assume, for the sake of simplicity, that they're um, roughly of equal density. And so they've got separate velocities, Vp and Vs here. Now, we haven't included here any production of um, network or degradation of network by the cells. This can be something um, potentially that's going on in certain kinds of experiments, but in the Moon and Tranquilo experiment, um, they f um, found that they were negligible, thought they were negligible, and so for simplicity, we uh, have stuck with that. And um, then we've got a similar conservation <coughs> equation for the cells. So the cells are infected um, with the polymer, and they also can move around randomly a little bit. And then the more complicated equations uh, come down here, which are the two conservation of momentum equations. So maybe I'll go through the, the top one, which is for the polymer um, sort of term by term, and the one for the solution is similar but simpler. All right, so um, we're going to assume that our, our polymer, our network, um, can be treated as a viscous fluid. So here is this um, sigma p here is the viscous stress terms. So as I believe John pointed out in his talk, um, because the individual velocity fields for the two phases here are not um, divergence three, you do have this extra sort of bulk, viscos bulk viscosity term um, that has to be there that wouldn't normally be there for an incompressible fluid. 
uh, we've got here a drag term between the two phases, the polymer and the fluid. We've got here a gradient of chemical potential, which I'll say more about later. This pressure is just the usual fluid pressure, which we assume is common to both phases. And then this um, G term, uh, gradient of G term, is the forces that come from the cells. So G is going to be a function of N, and that's going to incorporate, essentially, um, the, the forces that are cells are generating <coughs> and exerting on the polymer. All right, so then for the solution, well, we have basically the same thing, except for um, we assume that the cells uh, don't exert forces um, on the solution, just on the polymer. Okay, so then to actually specify um, sort of what's going on with the gel, uh, we copied someone else's homework, and namely um, from these two papers, so uh, Keenis, Sirkar, and Sneed, um, and a very similar thing um, in the model from uh, Mori et al. So essentially, we can relate our two chemical potentials um, to this free energy term here. So this term out the front, we can just think of, for the sake of our model, as being a constant. I think this is Boltzmann's constant. This is the, something like the volume of a monomer, and this T is meant to be the temperature. We're assuming that there isn't really a temperature variation during our experiment, so this thing that sits here is really just a constant. Um, this N here is the, the sort of the length of the polymer chain, and um, well, these mu P naught and mu S naught are what they describe as the standard free energies of the two phases, and then there's, I guess, basically a lot of what happens in the model depends on this um, chi term, which is um, about essentially the, the energetics of m mixing the two phases. And all of these constants are um, non-negative, except this chi, which can be negative, can be allowed to be negative. All right, so that's, that's sort of the polymer um, stuff, and like I say, that's, that model there is, is um, really based on a previous model that we sort of took as a, as a basis. Um, for the cell-generated forces, again, um, we took something that was quite similar to what was already in the literature. So if people are familiar with Murray's mathematical biology book and its mechanochemical models, um, they might remember seeing something that looks like this in there. I think the only difference is that they don't put a squared. Now, the reason we put a squared is that we wanted um, the gradient of this, which is always... Um, sorry, the gradient of this, which is what gives you the force, um, to always be going up um, gradients of n. So if you have a, a power 1 there, I think it can change sign, if I remember correctly. Anyway, that's, it's, it's very similar to what uh, has been done in the literature. Uh, and then finally, um, for this slide, well, on our interface of the gel, so that's... Um, we can sort of, in general, call that gamma g this interface equals zero, but in our setup, the, the interface is the, um, the boundaries y equals h and x equals l. Um, well, we're essentially saying that ju that just moves with the polymer velocity. All right, and then I think just to kind of close things off, well, here are our boundary conditions. So we've got a continuity of stress at the gel interface. So this square bracket notation is meant to mean um, the, the change in that quantity across the interface. The n hat is the unit outward normal as, as usual. So continuity of uh, stress between the mixture and the fluid outside is what we've got there, essentially. Um, zero flux of cells going out of the gel. And then uh, this last um, equation, this last boundary condition, um, is uh, similar to what Maury had in their model, which is a bit of a generalization um, from the earlier Kina paper. So essentially, this is saying that um, the difference in normal stress drives 
some flux of um, fluid um, across the interface. And there's this parameter R here, which is like the resistance of the interface to having water squeezed out of it. All right. So, um, because I like doing things with thin films, and I sort of set up this idea earlier, I hope that, um, that thin disks of gel were something that's experimentally relevant. Hopefully, it won't come as a surprise that when we non dimensionalize, um, we're going to focus on introduce, or we're going to introduce and, and focus on the usefulness of um, the small aspect ratio. So, we're saying essentially that the gel. Um, sort of typical length dimension, typical value of L is much bigger than the typical thickness H. And well, after quite a bit of algebra, I think after, when it says long and fairly painful, that's, that's a mild understatement. Um, we can establish that um, in fact our cell uh, density and our polymer fraction are independent of the depth coordinates, so that's y here, and you can reduce it down um, to this set of four, um, um, four PDEs that just depend on time and on x, and so this is a little bit like a more complicated version of the Troughton model for a standard um, incompressible viscous fluid that people might be familiar with. All right, so all of the gory details of this can be found in our paper, um, which after sort of lingering a while in the, in the presses, eventually has been published just a few weeks ago. And of course, we've got to have um, you know, appropriate boundary and initial conditions for all of this, which again can be found in the paper. All right, so I'm conscious I don't want to run out of time. So the one nice thing, I suppose, after doing all of that uh, algebra, we can make it even simpler. So if you start with um, the cells and the um, polymer distributed in a spatially uniform way, you can show that that um, continues. And the whole, the whole system can be reduced down to this ODE for H. You can find all your other variables in terms of this H. Um, your uh, velocity v just comes out to be um, linear in x times a function of time that you can relate to this thing. So it all um, is, is simple enough even for me to simulate in MATLAB. Um, so as you might expect, um, depending on how you set up your um, chemical potentials, uh, whether sort of mixing is advantageous or not, um, essentially, you can get either a swelling sort of solution or a um, shrinking kind of solution. So, uh, if you get a, um, a swelling sort of solution, well, you find that your polymer fraction goes down like this over time and your height goes up. And, well, for a shrinking solution, the reverse. So that was sort of the base case with no cells in there for the, to start off with. Um, so what, do we, what happens if we put the cells in? Well, essentially, um, what we've got on uh, the left here is um, the one that was previously a um, swelling solution. Well, if you put the cells in and this parameter tau, which measures how much force they exert, is large enough, you can turn that swelling gel into a contracting gel. So here you can see the polymer fraction goes up, the height goes down, gel shrinks, and well, the cell density, which is this dotted line, goes up. But if your cells don't exert that much force, which is what happens on the right here, well, you still get an expanding solution. So the height has gone up, uh, polymer density has gone down, um, but it just doesn't expand quite as much as before. Okay, so the more interesting cases are um, where things are not initially all um, spatially uniform, if you've got some kind of non-uniformity. So what you find 
by uh, doing some um, analysis is that uh, your equilibria should have a spatially uniform holomer, but there isn't any restriction on what happens to the gel height. So you can find, so here, um, we've got a expanding gel, and so, well, you start with a perturbed polymer, but eventually it becomes uniform, but your gel expands in its height, but it's, it, when it settles down to an equilibrium, it's not necessarily, um, space, it's not necessarily a straight line. And that's uh, almost, well, that's because we don't have any surface tension in our model, so there's nothing to penalize this not being flat. So again, we can get um, a similar sort of behavior when uh, you put the cells back in. So here, um, we start with the perturbed polymer, and well, in this case, our gel shrinks. We still have um, a, not, a not uniform shape in H at the end, but well, the cells and the polymer do um, have to end up being uniform. Um, so the one slight difference is if we perturb uh, the cell density to begin with instead of the polymer density, well, then you do end up with a, with a flat interface. This, don't get the persistence of the of the non-flat H. <coughs> okay, so the final case is one um, that is interesting in the sense of if you if you turn off the cell diffusion, you can get these equilibria where the cell distribution is not uniform. Um, however, when we derived our thin film approximation, essentially one of the things that we needed in order to ensure that that all worked was that we, we sort of scaled the um, diffusion term to be order one. So this is a little bit dodgy, but it, you know, if, if I guess, um, sort of if you, if you just naively set in the model that D equals zero, uh, then you can get these sort of solutions with non-uniform cell distribution. All right, so, um, more or less keeping to time. Um, here's just a quick summary of what we did. So one of the things um, that is potentially sort of um, useful with these kind of models and not something that we thought about when we set off doing this work, but which we actually discovered um, when we came to write it up for publishing it, um, is that people are actually interested in using osmotic pressure um, to exert stress or strains on your cells because that can help them differentiate and function in certain ways, I think particularly for things like um, cartilage cells. So if you, if you change the composition of the bath outside the gel, you can expand or contract your gel and that might actually be a desirable thing to do in order to get um, your cells to, to experience a certain amount of strain. Um, so that's something that you could kind of look at using this model. Um, but the thing that we've turned out to be most interested in in our group since we've done this is actually we've been looking a lot more at uh, biofilms, particularly yeast biofilms um, with collaborators both in Adelaide and here in the UK. And so one of the things that we're interested in with biofilms is um, when they're <coughs> sort of sitting on a um, fairly sort of um, moist um, substrate like agar does um, producing extracellular matrix, the cells producing extracellular matrix help um, essentially to suck up nutrients from that layer. Essentially by pulling in the water osmotically does that help them um, expand by getting more nutrients. So that's something that we're sort of interested in um, at the moment and which I will just talk about briefly in a second. Um, all of the details of what I've talked about today are in these two papers. Um, thanks to these two sources of funding, um, particularly Westpac Bank, which um, funded James PhD, and currently the rest of us are enjoying the, uh, the largesse of the Australian Research Council, which is um, funding us being here, which is fantastic. 
Um, but yeah, just to, to give a little bit of a trailer for Alex's poster and also to explain where we're going with this work, we're, we're interested in, in biofilms, which are sticky communities of uh, cells, fungal cells, can also be bacteria, but we're interested in yeast um, that live in a sort of um, layer of um, fluid and extracellular matrix or extracellular polymeric substances um, that they produce themselves. And the fact that they're living in this kind of sticky gunk uh, means that they're protected from the harsh environment outside. So examples of biofilms um, include plaque that you get on your teeth, and they can also be things <coughs> that colonize um, medical devices. So if that happens, that's very bad because you get a hospital-acquired in infection that's quite hard to eradicate. So Alex um, has done a really nice model of um, an expanding yeast biofilm. So you've got the substrate here that the, the yeast is growing on, which has um, nutrients in it, um, and the nutrient diffuses up into the biofilm, which um, the cells proliferate and expand. So again, this is a multi-phase um, mixture theory model, and there's some nice thin film approximations and, and lovely things that you can do with this model. But the next step that we're interested in is to try and combine these two models that we've got and say, well, if this substratum is in fact a layer of, of agar that contains your nutrient, um, agar can contain different amounts of water and does the osmotic effect actually help um, pull in the nutrient to help the biofilm expand? All right, I think that is my time, so I will um, finish there and thank you very much, all of you, for listening. Thank you. Thanks for a really nice talk. You mentioned at the start that you were assuming the densities were fairly similar. How much more complicated or tractable is it if they're different? Um, I don't think that it's necessarily going to get vastly more difficult, just a bit more messy. Uh, yeah, I am. Um, yeah, to be honest, we haven't really thought about that carefully because I think for most of the, the things that we were looking at, they were relatively similar. Or, or we just didn't know and felt that was an okay assumption. But I think it just makes it more messy rather than a lot more difficult. So I had a question down here. Um, do you kind of... Do you uh, see any like cell clustering? At all, like because you've got the attractive forces going on. Um, if you don't like have enough cells in the in the um, gel to start with, do you sometimes see them clustering into individual like populations? Or uh, that is a good question to which I don't know the answer. I'd have to um, talk to some experimentalists. So, um, like <coughs> when I started years and years ago, looking at this gel shrinking problem, doing some different kinds of models. I was working with a group in Ohio State, um, and they've got a couple of papers, I think, by um, Mark Stevenson, and, and um, th this was a guy in, in um, Keith Gooch's group, so I think they, they might have looked at that problem, but off the top of my head, I can't remember. But yes, it seems, seems sort of credible that that would potentially happen, but I can't tell you for definite. Thank you again, Ed. Thanks. Thanks.